experts then, so therefore this has definitely existed for over, almost over 2,000 years. And the brilliant or the most amazing concept of it is, is that it still exists today and is actually in its full form today. And actually the younger generation is actually taking it up. And I actually went to India this December to perform for the first time. And you have almost 3,000 concerts in a period of 20 days being performed by students, not only in India, but a large majority of students from here also. So it's an art form that not only is ancient, but is actually being, it's thriving through this uh, modern culture, which is a big feat in itself. But in terms of history, there is one period of time that needs to be actually really dwelled upon, which is the 16th century, 17th century area, which is kind of the golden age for our music. And the reason why we call it our golden age is because there were specifically three composers. Actually, I have a PowerPoint slide. So these are what we call traditionally as the trinity of Carnatic music. And during this age of the 16th and 17th century, they were there and they actually be, they were composers and they also underwent musical training. But through their lives and through their hardships, they actually composed uh, music in their own in their own way and under these um, within within the confines of our Carnatic music. And these compositions are purely devotional. Uh, they each had their own preferred deities, uh, and they composed voraciously on each and every one of them. And it's these compositions that have been traced down over 200, 300 years that we sing today. And these, these three trinity are probably the biggest composers that we know of today. There are many, many more, uh, many, many more composers. But these three, 95% of the music that we perform today is purely from them. And uh, as you can see in the middle is Thyagaraja. He uh, was from 1767 to 1847. The, the amazing thing is all three of them were contemporaries. They lived in the same time and they actually lived in the same area. Yet. There is no actual history or any written, uh, any written uh, story about them actually meeting at any point of time. Yet we look at them as all three as together. We don't look at them separately. And yet it's amazing that back then they lived within such close proximity to each other and never actually met. So Thyagaraja had a very, uh, a very poor, a very, uh, very poor background. He was very poor, and he had to through that hardship he composed. So most of his devotional music is very emotional. It's mostly asking God exactly why he's going through this hardship. And it's that motivation through which he composed. And he's, had, he's composed, according to uh, books, over 2,000 compositions, of which only around 800, 900 of them have actually survived. Um, there are many projects going on about trying to actually get these uh, remaining songs, but that's only through uh, journals and, story and accounts written by his students. And his preferred uh, Swami was Lord Rama, who is an incarnation of Lord Vishnu. And his compositions are, uh, are sang you know, throughout the world. And actually, during this time in January is his birthday, which is when we celebrate that, and we actually sing in, in praise of him. To the left, you have Muttaswami Dikshitar, who lived in the same exact time. Uh, his style was very different. He was actually very well off to begin with. Um, and he actually had a very big interest in the veena, which is a musical instrument. And the veena is, is core to Carnatic music because it actually has the concept of gamaka, which is a concept that we'll discuss later, built into the instrument. And so his music and his compositions really showed that. They're extremely flowy. They have a very, you know, um, rather than having speed as the concept, they're very slow and they show the essence of the music. And furthermore than that, he was very good at showing history within his music. A lot of his music was composed on a certain deity in a certain location, and there would be a certain story behind that deity, and he would actually portray that within the music itself. So each and every one of his pieces are considered masterpieces, both of music and of history. And on the right, you have Shama Shastri, the eldest of the trinity. And like Dyagraja, he had a very poor background. He was extremely poor, and his family was <coughs> his family was focused on the deity or the female goddess Kamakshi or Devi and all of his compositions are very sad they're very sad to listen to but they have so much music in them again that they're considered one of the some of the best compositions in Carnatic music so these three constitute the trinity as we call it in Carnatic music and again their compositions are purely devotional and so that's why um, most of what I'm going to present today has that devotion aspect built into it and with that, we can actually, with some basic, with this information in, in our hand, we can talk about the theory about it, but we can also keep this in mind. Please go next one.
So this is, I didn't have a better picture to show, but this is a picture of me here performing in uh, December. And I just wanted to give an idea of exactly how a concert or how Carnatic music is composed in a concert. You have the singer in the center, <laughs> singing just like I am. To the right you have a double-headed uh, drum, which is called a mirdangam. It's very unique in that, first of all, it's double-headed. Second of all, the percussion actually has a pitch built into it, which is very different than percussion, stand, standard percussion here. So it's not like just anybody can come and pick up a drum and play for me. They actually have to get the pitch perfectly to my pitch, which is very interesting and very new. So actually there's lots of studies being done on the membranes of these drums because the pitch itself is actually a big aspect in percussion. So that makes it the same thing as for tabla. Tabla, unlike the murdangam, which is one, one drum with two heads, this is actually two separate drums. But again, the same concept applies. The smaller head um, has a pitch associated with it. And the right big drum is for bass. And on the right you see the standard violin, which is a Western musical <coughs> instrument, which actually was introduced to Carnatic music by Dietschitter's older brother, which was the person on the left, as you saw. So it's a very, compared to Carnatic music, the violin's component is very young, you could say. But it's essentially an integral part of every con uh, concert that you have nowadays. So this is a standard, standard uh, composition of a concert. <coughs> and now that we have that, I think we can move on to describe some basic music theory. And again, since I didn't know exactly what kind of an audience I'm going to be getting, I kind of programmed or planned this all out, comparing it to Western music theory, since I thought that might be the best place for us all to start. So in terms of music itself, let's start off with the idea of music. Can anybody tell me just in general any components that are to music, two or three components that music entails? Rhythm. Rhythm, one for sure. Anything else? Melody. Melody, two. Is there anything else? Huh? Scale. Skill, okay. Scale. scale. Oh, scale. Scale, yes. Scale and melody, I guess, can kind of fit in together, but there is a distinct difference, which we'll discuss for sure. Power. Perfect. So these are three components of, as we call, Carnatic music. Melody, rhythm, and bhava. Bhava means devotion, or, or devotion to both the music and to whom we're singing about. That concept is may not be shown in all forms of music. I think the best example would be maybe gospel music. Gospel music definitely has the devotion built into it, and you can definitely hear that in the music. So actually, if you were to sing just purely with melody and, and rhythm, in our music, it would not be appreciated whatsoever. It, unless that bhava is there, you can actually, you know, it would, uh, it doesn't become the art form that it was meant to be. So those three components are quite crucial to our Carnatic music, and we're going to com keep coming back to that. So now let's take them one by one and discuss them in terms of both Western music and Carnatic music. So in terms of Western music, we have the concept of the scale. Can anybody give me examples of scales that we have in Western music? C major, D major. C major, D major. I'm talking more generic, like diatonic scale. We can have diatonic scale and we have chromatic scale. <clears throat> now we, let's say we take the major scale. The major scale is just the major notes in, uh, in the diatonic scale. Now if we just sing that, I'm just going to use C sharp as the bass since that's what I use. Mm, do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti, do, do, ti, la, so, fa, mi, re, do is the standard major scale. Now just to get some notation down, the notation for Indian music is very similar to that, just what I just sang, except the words are a little different. You have Sariga Ma Pa Da Ni Sa Sa Ni Da Pa Ma Ga Ri Sa So it's just the same exact concept of the, you know, the, uh, what's that, the Sound of Music song that we have? Do a dear that song, except the same thing is, you have a different set of notes for that. So I'm not going to ask you to like repeat all that, but this is something that we're going to, I'm just going to leave this up the entire, the rest of the talk. So we have these eight notes or seven notes. The, as you can see, you have saw on both sides, which is just the next octave. So now let's discuss the concept of melody. Let's take this concept of scale. So you have the major scale. Let me sing what we have as a major scale in Carnatic music, which actually has the same exact notes, but it may sound a little different to you. And I wanted to see if you could notice the difference. Mm -hmm. I sang the same exact scale with the same exact notes, but did you guys notice any differences in that? 
were you able to notice any, what was the difference between the major scale that I sang with the Western music and the major scale that I sang with Carnatic music? Was there any specific difference that you noticed? I think you attached the next note to the previous one. Okay. So there was a bit more flow into it, it wasn't distinct notes. Anything else? Oscillations or angles There were oscillations? Okay, good. Now this concept of that oscillation is kind of key to our music. And it's not the same as the concept of vibrato. Vibrato is an oscillation at a single frequency. What I did was an oscillation of frequency itself. Now what that is, is is actually connecting different notes. So let's say we have Let's just take those last three notes. Let me sing it a different way. That middle note ma is actually defined as an arithmetic mean or a middle ground between the note before it and the note after it. It's merely a note to connect two notes. So in what it actually is, is this is called what's called gamakam. Gamakam is the concept of oscillation of a note. And it's actually something that's unique to Carnatic music because I don't think you see this kind of oscillation anywhere else in most other forms of music. You see vibrato, but vibrato is not the same as this. So you can have different oscillations and each note has a different oscillation. So each note has its own distinctive form of oscillations, so form of gamaka. And you'll notice that some notes actually don't have any oscillation. For example, sa ri ga ma pa da ni sa. So you notice that certain, so this ragam, this major scale, which we call Shankara Vatnam, has both still notes and oscillation notes. And this is the concept that kind of is the heart of our music. Because if you take that oscillation away, you kind of brings us back to just which is definitely not the same as what we what I just sang. Now this oscillation is different. It's the same note in the same ragam could have different types of oscillations and I can show you that right now. If we take I can also sing it as that same ma note could have a number of different oscillations. And the skill of a singer or the skill of any performer is knowing how to reach that oscillation, how to approach that oscillation in the right way. Because when you sing that at the right note, if I was just gamma pa is different from gamma pa is different from gamma pa ma. So in each and every ragam you have oscillations and you have oscillations of the same note in different very in different and varied forms. <coughs> Does anybody have any, any questions or anything along these lines? By the way, I'm, I'm just going to keep talking, but you're welcome to stop me at any point of time and ask questions. So I know this is all very new, so I don't want to just keep moving forward without any uh, discussion or any anything before that. So, yeah. Do the oscillations depend on either you're going up the scale or down the scale? Yes, so there's different ways if you're going up you'll have different oscillations. If you're going down, you'll have different... Exactly how I showed... If I showed the ma again, ga ma pa, you'll never have pa ma Actually, you could have that. pa ma That's also a different kind of oscillation. It's going pa ga pa ga pa ga rather than ga pa ga pa ga pa. So depending on which direction you're going on, you can have very different oscillations. And the thing is, there are, the oscillation has to be used at the right time. And that only comes by listening. By listening to music constantly, constantly. And the thing is, listening to these compositions that this trinity have composed, because they are truly masters of these ragams. They have actually studied them so well and have the inbuilt talent to have composed in them that they're able to show all these different oscillations within their music. So it's by learning these compositions and learning a varied number of compositions that you become aware of these different oscillations and are able to use them yourself. So now we have the major scale, but the obvious question is, are there other scales? Are there other ragams? How do you get to those? So now we have, let's move to the Western music. We have something called the chromatic scale. Can somebody tell me what the chromatic scale is? I'm not questioning you, I just wanted to. A sharp B, 
C, C sharp, F, all the notes. All the notes, right? It's all the notes, meaning if you take a certain scale, you'll have 12 notes. 12 notes. But if you take any Western music, do you actually see all 12 notes apparent or any of the 12 notes apparent at any, at any given point of time? You'll never see certain of these 12 notes in Western music. There's a bunch of them that will never actually be manifested in, our, in Western music. So if you take... Mm, 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 you can just keep going like that. But the point is, many of those notes do not actually manifest in Western music. And the interesting about Carnatic music is, is every single one of them manifests. So we actually have a complete, complete set of ragams that are taken from <laughs> all 12 notes. You have, we have a set um, that actually, using permutation and combination theory, you have a set of 72 ragams that has every permutation and combination available with these 12, cons with these 12 notes, which is what makes it extremely different from standard music theory because these, like the, let's say, minor sixth or minor third, these notes don't appear in standard music, standard Western music. Do you know why they don't appear in Western music? I honestly would not be able to tell you. Um, do you have, you have the concept of like circle of fifths, circle of fourths? I remember a, a friend was telling me about them. So like if you have uh, like C, then you go by circle of fifths and you, I, I don't know much about it, but somebody who plays guitar would definitely be able to tell you. Like those kinds of notes, they know that they're there, but for music, they don't really appear so much. Um, it's basically that if, if you have all the 12 notes, it just does not sound right. So you go by calculations to circle of fifths to come up with each and every one of these scales. Right. You have probably seven or eight of these. Right. Well, actually, I maybe I misspoke. We never have all 12 at the same time. We have seven, but the thing is, we choose from every one of the 12. That actually does not happen in Western music, right? Because many of those, some, if depending on which scale you start on, some of those 12 may never appear just because it's not really known to Western music. So, that first note, immediate first note, you hardly ever see in Western music. What you usually see is, you notice that second note. But that first one, such notes you never see manifested in Western music. So that's why when people talk about Carnatic music, they actually describe it as a complete set of music. Because you actually can, given any note from that 12 scale, you can find a number of ragams that actually manifest that. So now I've thrown this word ragam around a lot. Let's fix that first of all. So as I discussed before, we have what's called this gamakam, this oscillation in scales. Ragam is essentially going a little bit further than scale, which encompasses both the scale and the gamakams that are available in that ragam. Depending on the ragam that you choose, there may be different, different oscillations. You can't just pick and choose your own. Those are actually predefined in the ragam that you learn by listening to music. So if we take a different, different scale, a different ragam, you'll see different uh, oscillations exist. For example, I can just give you this is a scale that you will never see in Western music. It's actually one that is very crucial to our music. It's called Todi, and it's very often taken up as a main as a main song, a, a very very heavy ragam. And it actually has all notes that you would never see. It has minor uh, the first note. It has minor third. It has uh, minor sixth, minor seventh. So then these notes you never usually see. But when we say ragam, we don't refer to these notes. We refer to the entire, it's like a, I guess the, the very philosophical, you know, humanity's way of saying it is a living being. It's a, it's a living, you know, creature. It has different, different shades to it, which you can show depending on these oscillations. And that's just, this is this kind of a basic point that I wanted to get across is that these oscillations are what make each ragam, uh, each ragam separate entity. So we've had ragams that have existed since even the 12th century. Ragams like, for example, Yamuna Kalyani, which you hear in kind of North Indian music. Such ragams have existed for centuries, and these gamakams have existed with them, and they've, you know, they've been given to us by our teachers and by their teachers. And these these oscillations are what are crucial to them, which is what we, which is what we perform in a regular Carnatic concert.
So now that we have some concept of ragam, let's move on to the second concept, which is rhythm. So what kind of rhythm is there usually in Western music? Usually you have an eight beat cycle, an eight beat cycle. Uh, and we have a very similar, essentially the same kind of concept in Western music, in Carnatic music, which is an eight beat cycle, which we actually, the interesting thing about Carnatic music is we always have a beat going which the singer provides. Usually in music, even though I have a percussion, even though he's providing the beat, I always have to provide my own beat, which I, I maintain the beat of the concert. So for example, for the eight beat, this is how we keep beat. It's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. It's just a standard beat that you learn as you're learning music. And majority of the compositions are composed in this beat. And you can have a varied number of beats. I think there was a treatise composed in the 12th century describing 160 different beat cycles. So this is actually a, a very deep and very vast subject, which is called the mathematics of chronotic music. And it's actually taking these different beat cycles, applying different combinations, applying different mathematics to them to actually get aesthetically pleasing uh, beats. So for example, if we take just regular aditam, you want to play for aditam? You just listen to him play. One. So if you notice in this, you can actually, I'm going to count with him. Or in, in our standard colloquial language for chromatic music. So this is the standard, standard basic cycle that you see in Western music. You see an eight beat cycle, and within each beat you have four sub subunits. And this is what comprises the standard beat cycle for Western music, and we have that in Carnatic music too. So now it begs the question, why does there have to be four in them? Can we have different numbers of beats within them? We can have an eight beat cycle, why can't we have three in each beat? This is a concept that's now recently being introduced into Western music. The concept of changing, this is I think what we call three-quarter speed. So it's a concept that is very traditional to us. We actually employ it on a regular basis. But it's something that's very new to Western music. And three is just one. We can do five, we can do seven. Or you can do even seven, you can do nine. And the limit is of course how fast we can sing. Because once you get to like 11, your tongue is just going to... <laughs> get into a couple knots. But the point is, you can actually introduce different amounts or different rests per beat, which is something that's very unique to our music as well. So you can see that it's both unique to, in terms of its melody, which makes it very different from Western music, and in terms of its beat, makes it very different from Western music as well. Any questions? Any thoughts? Anything? Just a fun fact. Um, huh? Pink, Pink Floyd did a lot of experiments. They've done a lot. If you listen to a lot of rock music, they'll even, I think Franz Ferdinand even has a song where they go from 4 beat to 3 beat to 4.